is such a subjective thing, and I think that's the difficulty with the debate around mm. responsibility and morality. And it is fundamentally a subjective yeah. matter, um, and uh, it is one that you know families will shape based on their own priorities, their own religious, cultural, social, political mm. worldview, uh, and that is the difficulty in it. But it is currently being debated in a sort of public arena where I think the sort of morality debate and the principles informing it are sort of very unsubstantiated and quite vague really but I think that is going to continue but I think one of the one of the bene well one of the upsides of the increasing disclosure is it's 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 really making clients articulate the purpose of the wealth much better yes. so they're much better prepared they're much better prepared in terms of their governance and the yes. way that they articulate it and the way that they then transport or they, they cascade those shared values down through the generations and the family. Yes. So the way the family operates is... It's much more you know, sophisticated known, I think, yeah, than it ever, consistent. ever was. Um, you can limit the extent to which your children receive your wealth. And you can also, depending on how strict you are, limit it um, to, to very strict things such as educational costs, medical expenses, and maybe modest accommodation. With one very wealthy family who feel very strongly that the children must find their own way. And so the trusts, or whatever structures they're using, or whether it's from their private pocket, they will only give the children so much. But this is partly about instilling values and behaviours in the children from an early stage, so there isn't an expectancy or a dependency on distributions, which is otherwise what you create if uh, a child has never really known the value of anything or the purpose that they can serve, whether or not it's in an industry or in charity. Mm. But they've got to have something in their lives which is constructive and productive. And that's generally what most parents want, even if it's not the most commercially successful venture, that they actually are um, engaged in the world and contributing something, not sitting on a sofa waiting for the next check to arrive. Each family is different, mm. but you know, the, the discussions around you know, how do they come to the table in terms of decision making and access to the wealth? Do they have to attain particular things in their lives, be it education attainment or involvement in the family business or starting up a particularly successful business or finding a, a place in the, sort of, in the philanthropic activities of the family? So every family, you know, these families are working hard today at sort of shaping that um, how the next generation come to the table and share in that wealth and are stewards for that for generations to come. I think it's, it's a very different discussion to sort of just making sure your children are provided for. I mean, these families can do that sort of mm. 10 times mm. over. It's more around, you know, how does that responsibly transition uh, and how are the children protected from that wealth? And I think reputational capital is so closely linked to that today. And I think that's one of the, the big drivers as well what, the reason why families are paying so much attention to mm -hmm. that. Transition, transition is one of the most difficult areas of all as you bring on the next generation. And that's where a lot of disputes and family disharmony arises because there hasn't been communication about what the char char charitable endeavour is for the family or the priorities are. And that's the other aspect of our role as uh, the uh, professionals, to help spot where crossroads appear, where actually it's right that a fund is perhaps... Um, segregated out and that different parts of the family have different um, ideas about what this social responsibility might be and how it might be performed and what they want to do with their, their part of that money rather than trying to keep it collectively in a pot that is actually from a great-grandfather or great-grandmother um, with some dictation around what's to happen to it. That's always difficult. You do need flex and you do need the ability also, I think, to segregate as these generations grow and as the family tree grows vertically as well and you get pressure about different priorities from different parts of the family. So it's mm. managing that too. I think one of the most interesting thing about it is as well, I mean, we look at it as the next generation being that risk to the wealth. And yet, in fact, the number of situations that I'm involved with, it is very much that next generation that is going to help sustain the family brand and, and the wealth going forward, because that is where the understanding of what mm -hmm. wealth in today's world actually means, lies. It's not necessarily with the sort of 90-year-old mm -hmm. patriarch who may have inherited it himself. It is actually the next generation who see their role in taking that wealth and bringing it into today's world in the environment that, that we are in today, which is very different and will continue to change, I suspect.